start the, uh, the next session of the day, unless anyone needs to do something wrong. No? Great. So, uh, this uh, afternoon, the topic is these max test union components, which are very dear to my heart. It was a large part of my PhD project. And so, I've prepared a few talks for you today and some exercises in order to teach you how to use this. So here is an overview of our entire three-hour session, where we have first this uh, introduction talk, which is this one, where I will talk a little bit about the concentric keyword that you also heard about earlier, and then what these union components uh, do that's a bit different and a bit more general. And then when you have these basic building blocks of understanding, you'll have uh, some time, maybe an hour, for an exercise where you will build some sample environment yourself. Then there will be another talk, I think uh, I've scheduled this for half past two, where we will uh, do an additional showcase of how far you can go with this software and introduce some new concepts. And these you will then use in the next exercise later in the day, and then I'll end the entire session at around quarter to four with a, a short view on how you use it for this uh, entire instrument simulation if you want to go that far. So first, a few words about multiple scattering, because the union components are about multiple scattering, and how we deal with this normally in <coughs> So, multiple scattering will happen even if you just have a sample with nothing around it, even if it's just hovering in vacuum. You're going to have several scattering events inside of the sample. Of course, if you have a your sample in a sample can, this is also some material that can scatter. And if you have a prior start, you have a separation between your sample and so on. And why is there an issue? Well, of course, if you measure an ingoing and an outgoing wave vector, then you assume this is my scattering vector and everything is nice. But this could also have happened by multiple scattering, by one scattering of here and here, and you could have gotten some other path. And you would mistake one for the other. So this is annoying here. Here it becomes difficult in the sample canister because now the two scattering events could be from two different physical systems and so there are more combinations to consider when you design your experiment. And if we go to the sample environment, we have the added difficulty of added length. In a, at a time of light source, you will now consider this outgoing wave vector to be of a different length because you measure a longer time even though the scattering might have been elastic. So the added distance in the larger sample environment causes its own set of issues on a time of flight source. And as Peter already explained, the most standard way in MaxFest to deal with this is to use the concentric uh, parameter that's included in some components. And Peter explained how it works in the power in component, and I will look at how it works in the isotropic SQOmega component that we'll talk more about tomorrow. But for this purpose, you should just know that it can scatter uh, a large number of times, so we can have multiple scattering. And in, in this context, the first instance of uh, the component container describes the outside, the next is the sample, is the inside, and the last is the outside again. And we can then have events like this, that go and scatter in the outside, then go in and out again. And what happens is that when it crosses this line, this dashed line, it goes to the next component. And when it goes out of the sample, it goes to the next component, and then it cannot go back in. So something like this path would not be allowed because it went into the sample 
and then out again to the container, and then it tried to go back in. But this is just not working in the software. And this can uh, happen in, in different ways. Like either with two scatterings or three or more. There are many different paths that you have to consider. Is this relevant for my experiment or not? Now, if you go to the same environment where you introduce <coughs> this gap, the, the area of, of the circle where you leave the first component becomes larger. So actually, you can only cross this void once. Instead, if you try to do as before, it doesn't work. But you can almost consider the entire empty part the sample for the purpose of the first iteration of this. Okay, so there's some problems there, but it will also solve issues with at least a little sample camp very nicely. So what was the intention with the union components? Well, instead of just having these few concentric rings, we tried to simulate something that really looks like a cryostat and has the full three-dimensional description in a very modular way that, that really allows someone without experience in CAD programs to build something like this. And then there's no restrictions on what kind of trajectories that are allowed. The neutron can go and bounce around in this complex geometry as many times as it wants. And how will that work in our max test code then? Well, we have separated geometry and physics. So the geometry is described <coughs> in three basic components, spheres, cylinders, and cubes, or uh, boxes. They can have different dimensions. These are then assembled to your geometry. And normally when you've been working with Max, as I've been telling you, you're not allowed to put components into each other or on top of each other or something like that. But here, with the union components, you're allowed to do that. These restrictions have been lifted when you're working uh, in this system. Then, of course, we need to add some physical properties to these geometries. This is done by what I call material descriptions. And for example, we, have, we could have aluminum and nickel, and they're made from physical processes. So it's modular also in the physics part. And when I need to make aluminum, I take an incoherent process. This is our normal incoherence scattering. And then I might want to add rag color scattering. These two together I call aluminum. Of course I have to punch in the right cross sections and so on. Then nickel, I could add a single crystal instead and an excitation. The code underneath here is the same as the other max test components, the single crystal component and the incoherent. It's just now that they can be added together in any way you want. Also, uh, as many as you want, so you can make mixtures of materials by, by adding both the incoherent from one compound and another. And then, it's just a simple matter of connecting your geometries with their uh, material. And then how does this look in the code? Now let's define a material, aluminium. That's what we use the most in our sample environments. <coughs> we take and make a, an incoherent process, and we call it aluminium incoherent. And we just have to give the scattering cross-section, incoherent scattering cross-section, and the unit cell volume of the compound. The packing factor is just how, how tight you pack the compound. If you have several different material or compounds in there, you could make that a third and then have two thirds of something else. Then we have a powder process and we call that aluminium powder because we give it the data file for aluminium that is shipped with Maxas. And then we make the material with the union, union make material component. 
you get that uh, the absor absorption uh, inverse penetration distance, and then a string which contains the names of the of incoherent and the powder. And if you want to add more, you just have more names in this comma separated string. And remember this inverse penetration depth has a use of one over meter and can be calculated as the cross section per unit cell over the unit cell volume. Now schematically I like to draw this as two processes with round corners go together and make a material and I have this with white units. Okay. The next part is to consider the geometry. And now I need to introduce the priority, because if two things can overlap, then which material should we simulate in the middle where both of them exist? Well, we simulate the one with the highest priority. So it doesn't matter if they are separated spatially, but if we move them on top of each other, the area where they're both defined is the one with the higher priority. So you can use that to make the crazy shapes. For example, the crazy shape that we consider a cluster. We could take a huge chunk of material and then put a smaller geometry in there with a higher priority to remove part of it. Now we have something weird with a thicker wall on one side and a narrow on the other side, but it's really up to you to make whatever you want. We can add something that spans more of them and a higher priority still and take out parts so that we have uh, an entry hole of some kind. You can keep going on and making this more complex. But there's one thing you cannot do and that is to place two geometries so that they are perfectly tangential, that they share a surface. This is the new thing that will cause a lot of mistakes in the code and, and spit out a lot of errors during one time. However, all you need to do is overlap them or put a little gap between them of just a micrometer or two. <coughs> that, is, that is all that is necessary in order to avoid these errors. Now let's continue on our little file step. We already made aluminium. So now we add a geometry with our aluminium and it's going to be a big cylinder of just aluminium. We give it a radius and a height. I think actually the parameters for Y height as you're used to, I think there's a typo in the uh, presentation. Sorry about that. And then we give it this priority. So now the priority doesn't matter because it's a load. But then we add a second component here. We make the vacuum in the middle of the cluster. And there's always a material called vacuum. This is predefined because it just does nothing. No absorption, no scattering. And of course, we need to give that a higher priority if we place it inside the first one. Otherwise, we would just simulate aluminium in here. And then, of course, we need to have a smaller radius and a smaller height <coughs> in order to have walls on the side and the top. And I like to describe this as these two uh, going down to this master component. And what is the master component? That is the weirdest part about these union components. They actually don't do any simulation themselves. It's only when you insert this union master at the end. And that actually doesn't need any parameters at all. It's just a way you tell the simulation, I want my cryos at this point in the instrument file. And then all the simulation with all the materials and all the geometries will happen in this one component. And this I try to make a visual representation of. Okay, so let's look at, at what it would look like with a few materials and a few uh, processes and so on. For example, you could have a list over here with aluminium and copper processes. 
Then you combine them to make your materials. We want to make aluminium, copper, and of course we all, always have our vacuum. Then we might define some geometries with these. The vacuum of the cryostat, the walls, maybe some sample holder, and maybe the coil of a magnet. And then you need to add a master at the end, and it picks up on all these geometries that were added and simulates them as well. Okay, so what can we do with that kind of code? Well, if this is our ugly reality that we sometimes find on our beam lines with aluminium wire and a, a weird shape, well, we just keep adding our small basic geometries together with our boxes and some rings around with aluminium and some sample. And then that goes into max tests and we can get a nice absorption picture. Of course here I exaggerated the, the aluminium cross section so that I can get a nicer picture. In reality we would only just see the sample. So this was the introduction talk. Now uh, you have to look at the open exercise on GitHub and in this file I have already started out by defining a bunch of materials for you to look at. There is aluminium and vanadium and also a mix of different materials that you can use to create a weird sample environment. I already started by putting in one sphere, one cylinder and one box so that you can see the syntax to make a simple sample holder. But I now challenge you all to expand that to a little sample environment maybe some screws of some funny materials, and so on. Of course, there is more uh, help for you in the exercise text on GitHub. And I'd like to say already now that we will continue to use your whatever you make here in the next exercise after the next talk, where we'll analyze what goes on in your assembly model. And just to keep some idea of the schedule, I would say we will start this for uh, at half past two.